I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, Beyond Mobile and what that means for me, some of the thinking that's happening inside 9MSN, MI9, and some of the approaches that we're actually taking. Um, I think it's important to say I don't think we have the answers. Um, this is just some of the things that we're going through, the journeys that we're actually on. So I'll give you a little bit of background about what we do, um, some of our sort of uh, corporate sort of culture and history, um, a little bit of conversation around some ideas around uh, mobile strategy, and then, as Stuart mentioned earlier, uh, kind of like a chronology of one of our key developments that we're doing in this space called Jump In. And then a uh, kind of a suggestion, bringing together some of all of the concepts that I'll talk through through the deck as to uh, a bunch of tools that you might want to use to think about your problems in your environment. Okay, so um, a little bit of background about MI9. I'm, I'm trying to stand still, but it's not working. Um, we are, uh, as, you, as Julian talked about earlier, we are 9MSN essentially, and we are a sort of joint venture created by Microsoft and Channel 9. So we have two of the most ugliest parents you've seen in, in corporate history. <laughs> um, and and we, we, we create kind of predominantly digital properties on the web. We've got about 80 to 100 or so different properties out there um, with the number one news site in Australia. So we hit on average, uh, a large portion of the actual Australian population, 10.3 million unique uh, eyeballs on, on the properties that we have, um, with uh, some fairly interesting high numbers in the billions around page views. Video is quite interesting. We're seeing a huge growth in, in video. Um, last month, we did 38 million video streams to Australians. We did 50 million on average per month last year. So that's a fairly significant growth in, in sort of video uh, serving and a huge amount of that shifting towards mobile video delivery as well. Um, <clears throat> as I said before, we're the, we're the largest content publisher in Australia. Love putting this slide up because most people think other news or Fairfax are, but we significantly hammer them into the ground. Um, <laughs> Uh, we, we have, um, you know, obviously a fairly uh, equal split of male and female um, and a, a wide range of what we unashamedly call middle Australia as an audience. Um, favourite comment I've got from our editor-in-chief is we write articles and content aimed towards the mentality of a teenager. Um, so that, that's, we're not the Guardian, I think it's safe to say. So I'm apologising to our marketing team when they watch this back. Um, <laughs> As you can see from that, we've got a, you know, a, a peak at the 35 to 49, but 70% around, 70% of our audience is actually between 25 and 50. So a fairly reasonable reflection of what the Australian markets do. Um, briefly, just talking through some of what I think, we have a lot of challenges, and it would be kind of ridiculous to say I could put them all onto a slide, but looking at the top four, um, I, I don't think they're necessarily unique to us. One of the things that we are sort of, kind of uh, at the forefront of customer, um, consumer usage of devices and trends. We're really in a sort of media market with Channel 9 and, and Microsoft. We build properties around um, TV shows and, and various different things. We sell ads. That's how we make money. Um, so we're really sort of susceptible to, to customer changes and, and changes in trends, right? Um, and our products are entirely customer focused, so we don't have the liberty of creating really awesome relationships with partners that uh, we can kind of, you know, put contracts around and make them pay us lots of money, kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> as I've kind of just touched on there, we, it, it is an extremely turbulent market. Um, there are a few people in Channel Nine that probably won't admit this, but the free-to-air TV market is dead. Right, the, the the stats and the figures are out there. It's a declining market. You've got Netflix, Quick Flix. Hulu, all sorts of operators out there that are providing content over the internet through various different devices. Nobody wants to conform to a TV schedule guide and, and to be told you've got to watch a program at seven o'clock at night or whatever. So um, there's a lot of change there. There's a lot, everybody knows the Microsoft story. Um, Horace has gone through a, you know, a raft of different stats. Um, it's unsure even internally inside our organization where Microsoft are gonna go, which is kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> delivering things the right, the right way, efficiently, and delivering the right thing, I think is a challenge that most technology leaders, most digital or product creators face. Um, how do you do it efficiently when, when 
I don't know if you've ever tried to hire iOS developers, they cost an arm and a leg. It's, it's insane, and, and they all want to work in funky little startup labs. So getting a capability in-house is really, really hard to do. Um, and actually delivering the right thing when you're working in markets that are so turbulent is quite challenging. So we're, we're really trying to work through that, and I've, I'll give you some sort of thinking around that. In, in a few slides' time. Um, an escape velocity, it's a reference in a book by Jeffrey Moore, who was mentioned earlier. Uh, one of our huge challenges is, and I think you may face this, you'll hear a bunch of topics today and maybe some ideas. How do you get back into your organization tomorrow or Monday morning and actually make some of those happen? Right? How do you escape the gravitational pull of your culture, of your operational plan, of your budgets, to actually go break out of that and do something different? And I think. Keith and uh, John are going to talk about innovation type frameworks this afternoon. So hopefully he'll have the answer for me and, and I'll have the answer for you as well. Um, just one thing I want to touch on before we work into the sort of the mobile space. We've done something fairly significant for us. We are uh, obviously a joint venture with Microsoft, which means we have a Microsoft technology stack. That makes recruitment for developers really hard, I'll tell you. Nobody wants to use Microsoft tools. Um, uh, and interestingly, we've moved from uh, a hosting provider based out of Adelaide to AWS, which is quite interesting because it's not Azure, right? It's not a Microsoft platform. It's the first time in our history we've been able to make a technology choice based on the technology itself rather than the politics. So that's quite cool. Um, we've done lots of cool stuff in there. We've got some real great specialists. Um, Sam Newman is going to talk this afternoon um, from ThoughtWorks and helped us introduce all sorts of different tools and techniques, um, you know, sort of puppet varnish, all the completely automated systems. Um, I didn't want to write the figures in the slide, but I'll talk to them now. We, our monthly hosting costs for some of our properties went from $350,000 a month down to $30,000 a month. That's hugely significant, obviously. That's funding some of our other development. Not only that, we can do things faster, we can do things better, we know in advance now when things are going wrong, we can see the loads, we can see the cache hits, we can see so much more information than what we were getting from our actual hosting provider. So that's been an interesting journey for us. Um, <clears throat> and I think something that's, uh, you know, that most of you are either considering or are in a transition to. So what does that mean for mobile strategy, right? Uh, firstly, I just want to say I haven't got any stats, right? I've seen Horace talk before. Awesome, love the tool, saw him at Swipe, knew he was going to do a fantastic job. The last thing I wanted to do was show you another chart, right? So I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to talk about mobile strategy. I think my, my, my impression, and I think the talks that we've already seen before, if you're talking about mobile strategy today, you're probably already behind the eight ball. Move on from that. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, we've looked at some of the, the, the history with Horace's slides. We've gone from some form of desktop-style computing, or if you go back early enough, room-sized computing, through to laptop and mobile, right? I must say, my, one of the goals of this talk that I set out to achieve was to talk about beyond mobile without talking about Google Glass, right? You won't see a picture of Google Glass in here. Um, so desktop, laptop, mobiles. What's your mobile strategy, right? So... Scott, at the beginning of the day, talked about sort of things like the Nike fuel band, right? We're going into a whole raft of new devices, wearable devices. This is an amazing piece of technology that's sub one millimeter thick that you, you actually sticks to your skin, lasts for a few days, and monitors all of your vital signs. So a little bit of a next step on from, from the Nike fuel band. Not quite sure how resistant to water it is, but you know, the wearable devices are going to progress on from just actual sort of Nike fuel bands. Nike fuel bands, I bought one of those at ThoughtWorks Live last year in, in May in London, right? So I've had a new Nike fuel band for a year now. It's old school. Johnny mentioned the eyeball. Check it out. There it is. Right? This is a retinal implant that takes the signals from your eyeball, processes them, and jacks them back into the optic nerve makes blind people see. That's a real device now. You can already get it, assuming you've got no sight. <laughs> so looking at implantable <laughs> devices, the, the, 
looking at implantable devices and wearable devices, obviously these are just, you know, just a few examples of them. There's some really awesome, meaningful devices out there, such as that one, such as the deep brain stimulation. I don't know if you've seen the TED talk around that. You know, the electrodes into the brain that they control actual Parkinson's tremors. So there's a woman standing there shaking away, and then they just turn it on, and she stops completely. You know, so technology usage today is, is just absolutely phenomenal. Where are we going to go tomorrow? I have no idea. But I, I really don't want to ingest one of these things because I don't, I don't want to retrieve it, right? So <laughs> this is an ingestible camera pill, right? So it comes complete with a battery, light, and, and a camera. Um, I'm not entirely sure how you retrieve the footage. I don't want to think about that. But um, there, there are technologies out there that, that you can actually now digest the whole thing. This is designed to pass through you, but the, there are batteries now that don't have all the poisonous chemicals in that you can actually ingest a device, it does something, and it will dissolve into your body and, and will be gone without harming you. So it's kind of pretty phenomenal kind of technologies out there. So mobile, yeah, that's cool. It's a bit of yesterday, I reckon. You know, let's do some of these things instead. So what? Mobile strategy? Don't think so. I think that's a bit yesterday. Should we talk about device strategies? Maybe, maybe, maybe that's applicable for you. I don't think so. For us, we're in a media sort of organization, and I think this is applicable to most companies and people out there. It's offering continuous experiences, right? So how do you pull all of those different devices together to prevent, present your product to your customers in the right way all of the time? <clears throat> so what does that mean? Do we know where our customers are, right? So our customers and our users operate in different zones. Are you lying in bed at night? Are you sat on the couch? You know, are you operating in your office? Are you on the bus? Are you walking somewhere, right? Understanding where they are is a key part of delivering your experiences. After that, what are the devices that they're using when they're there, right? There are a lot of stats out there that show tablet usage kicks in around 6 p.m. We've got a lot of, a lot of data that we capture from Omnichar on, on our users. It's phenomenal. The iPhone starts in the morning, the desktop takes over during the day, the laptop tablet kicks in overnight for the Australian audience. And, it, and it's, it's, it's fairly obvious, but tracking the actual device usage in the zones and the actual problems that your customer is actually trying to solve. So, um, rather than saying, what do you want, if you will know, if we go out there and ask our customers what they want, they'll either say, I don't know, or they'll want some rocket-powered shoes or something, right? You know, Henry Ford said, if I asked my customers what, I, what they want, they would ask for faster horses, right? But if you ask them what was the problem they're trying to solve, they're trying to go from A to B. So working out exactly what your customers' problems are is really important. Um, and thinking about the context that they're in when they're trying to solve that problem. Are they stressed? Are they relaxed? Are they looking to be entertained? Have they got 10 minutes? Have they got an hour, three hours? Putting all those things together to try to create a continuous experience across those zones, devices, and problems is, is going to be really essential to, to offering a really good sort of mobile strategy. So, Stuart mentioned earlier, we're doing a, a raft of work with a jumping product, and, and he mentioned sort of uh, content as well. So you've all heard the phrase in the past, content is king. I, I actually don't think so anymore, right? Um, we're talking about experiences now, but I actually don't think that's enough anymore. You know, you can't offer a huge sort of virtual reality 3D game on the PS4 that comes out, and it actually be an awful game. Right? It's not going to be good enough. You've got to focus on both of those things to be competitive in the marketplace today. You can have an awesome raft of content, but it's, if it's only deliverable by a HTML4 on a desktop, it's not going to be good enough. You need to offer really great content through really great experiences across as many of those devices that your customers are actually using. <coughs> so. With that in mind, I just want to go back and replay some of the thinking that we've done and some of the approaches that we've taken for our jumping product inside MI9 um, and the sort of application of that. So the idea is I just want to explain what it is. So any of you guys actually heard of jumping, seen it? No? It's probably 20% of the room. So it's a second screen experience that came from a couple of sort of classic kind of CIO, CEO sort of ideas. Hey, we're going to do this. And all of a sudden the dev team start working on it. That's, that's the unofficial line. Um, for around the, the London Olympics, so 
David Gingell, the, the CEO of Channel 9, yep, we're filming the Olympics, we're doing a, good, a big push onto TV for the Olympics. We need to have a second screen experience so that people can use the iPad and actually watch the Olympics and get some information about what's going on. What were the key things, who fell over, what, what awards were won, medals and things like that. So that, that's the, the evolution, the genealogy of where jumping came from. Um, the challenge is, quite interesting, you make a delivery around the Olympics, which was absolutely phenomenal. We partnered with ThoughtWorks. We did all of the development for the first one in 22 days. So we got through. It took us longer to get through the App Store than it did to do the development. Right. So what do you do after that? Right. This is a fairly sort of evolutionary space. You know, we don't really know what, what it means to have a second screen experience, but we can look at some of the stats. 77% of us, what that says is 77% of us have got ADD, right? We're all on Twitter, we're all checking emails, we're all using devices, we no longer want to watch TV, and that's phenomenal. And the split in Australia is about 49% for, for smartphone-style devices versus tablets. So there's a fairly equal split. Um, <clears throat> so what does that mean? What is social television? What are companion second screen apps? I don't know. I don't think the market knows. There are a number of competitors out there to, well, to jump in, and there are a couple of the Fango and Zbox. Um, so it's a, it's a really sort of unknown space. We, we know there are lots of devices out there. We know that the sort of broadcast TV watching trends are changing, and we know that people want to be more social. People want to be more engaged. They want to do something. They want to continue the show experience after the show's aired. So you've watched one episode of underbelly for instance the next one's on in a week's time how do you solve that problem we provide them with more experiences and engagement with a tablet to to keep them sort of sticky to your product um, <clears throat> so the approach that we actually took uh, to actually make a delivery of this product and, and sort of grow it as an increment was to look at the capability first and when you take any kind of new product development you've got to kind of understand what it is you're trying to do so from a business sense how critical is this to our business? And, and how differentiating it is in the marketplace? And for us, jumping sort of kind of sat around that sort of point there. Not critical, if it actually failed, yes, we would waste money, but we wouldn't actually kill some of our main revenue streams. But it's fairly differentiating because there are not that many people out there doing that. So understanding that gives us some leverage in terms of how we make our investments into there. And then how do you actually you know, go forward with the execution of that. Who do you use? How do you sort of get the resources and the capability and the talent in your organization? Now, we as an industry, uh, as a company, don't have strong mobile development, right? We built a mobile team about two or three years ago, um, knocked out a couple of different apps, and then they all left us and started startups, right? So it's a, you know, mobile developers are divas, I'll tell you. <laughs> Sorry, Stuart. Um, so looking at, at, at the, the actual product, right, if, if it's an exploratory product, and Johnny and Stuart mentioned that, it, the level exp of exploration of uncertainty on a product really affects the amount of involvement you're going to do. So if, if you've got a product like Jumpin where we don't really know what we're going to do, and you can see I used to be a manager, I pulled my hair out. You know, we, before we started this, we had, I had hair and we knew what we were doing. Um, but... That exploration is quite frustrating, and it means that you've got to be really engaged with your development teams. The business and, and, and the agile delivery metaphor really stands, stands to play there. You've got to be involved. For a product like this, it's my view, you can't offshore something like this. Offshoring is a very good option for certain things, but if your level of exploration is high, you need to be highly involved. So taking a choice of partnering with somebody for us was the only option, and that's where we work with people like ThoughtWorks. So we got ThoughtWorks into our offices, working alongside our developers, working with our business people. Um, continuous delivery um, is obviously the other one. Do I need to tell you about this? You're probably in the wrong room if you've not heard of continuous delivery. You know, iterative development, two weeks of iterations is how we run that. We have the designers and the UX people involved. We have mobile focus groups with customers coming in where we record the sessions, test out experiences, and we do a continual iterative sort of deployment process. Integrating into that a data strategy that allows us to capture how people are using the application, 
what, what sort of analytics are in the application is really important. And we need to understand the insights that we're trying to get from that. So continually going through that build, test, and learn sort of process. So just a bit of a, an overview. I think you've seen both of these slides from uh, Stuart's talk. On the left-hand side, it's the EPG, the Electronic Programming Guide, a utilitarian type sort of system where you can just find what's on, click on it, and then you get the right-hand screen, which gives you some content, right? Implementation-wise, quite interesting, made a choice to go native with the left-hand side, making use of the rich experience that native gives you, with web on the right-hand side giving you that extra content. So that, that allows us to do another thing as well. It allows us to keep our expensive iOS developers working on native and our content production teams internally doing all the content production. So as a journey, the next thing we looked at was what is it in the marketplace that we're doing that could be different? How, do, how can we compete against Vango and Zbox? Zbox is a sort of channel agnostic. It's not related to Channel 9. So we went through using tools like the business model canvas and worked out that our USP really was working with Channel 9 and amplifying that Channel 9 so that we can get extra content in there. We can get access to their stars. We can get them to filter into the actual applications and provide content that other of our competitors can't actually access. And then we responded to demand. The next thing we heard, that we got from our customers was, you know what, we're actually using this in the morning. We want to see the EPG in the morning so we can set reminders. We want that continuous experience. So providing an iPhone version was the next evolution for us. We kept back on that, on that, on that uh, sort of development on purpose because the minute you introduce yet another sort of platform or device, your development costs increase for every feature that you want to deploy. But it came obvious that we needed to do that. And then engagement and feedback. The branding was fairly obvious. It was, it, it was seen as an application that was just literally an EPG. So we took feedback back and we changed it. This is the latest development for Jumpin. It's a new format. It's a more kind of Zeit, Flipboard style interface that surfaces the content first up. You can still see the actual uh, EPGs at the top there, so you can get that interface back. But changing the, the, what we're actually presenting and surfacing the content in a different way, driven by what the feedback we got and the data uses that we were monitoring in, in the actual application. So I, I'm kind of rushing a bit through. I've just seen the five minute sign about two minutes ago, so I've got a, a few minutes left. I just want to round out the end of the talk with um, sort of some of the key principles and thinking that. Um, we've had in that journey and what we're trying to do inside MI9 and 9 <coughs> MSM. Excuse me. <coughs> Internally within our organization, we know a lot about data. We know more about the Australian population than anybody else does. We've, we've merged all our data with providers like Experian and through the Microsoft Ad Exchange. We know a hell of a lot about people. We, we at best, we hit about 89% of the online Australian population. So we can, set, we can target adverts to people that are looking for bikes, and we know that they've already started to choose a brand. We're that accurate with some of the data that we've got. And, and creating that continuous data strategy across all our devices and services, we have teams of people inside MI9 that are actually doing that. And that's really essential to, to doing to, to understanding where our audience is going and, and making our sort of value proposition even better. This is a tool I just want to show you that's been really critical to us. This is a tool called Chartbeat that we've implemented across our sites. Um, it's a real-time data analysis tool based on, on, uh, on our website. This number here, this is a poor day, the number of active people looking at this page. So 83,000. On our main news site, it's normally around 150,000 all of the time. Um, you can see some numbers here. These are the trending areas of the web page, the most popular. So that's the most popular click through. You then got number two down here. What this gives us is, a, is a, a huge dashboard that allows our content teams inside MI9 to move the content around and really leverage data in a real time way. It's such a reactive environment that we operate in. News comes in all of the time. You need tools like this that actually access the data and present it in a way that we can use properly. So finally, I think as a strategy, as a suggestion going forward, if, if you look at uh, three pillars of execution, I think, keep the continuous experiences, look across all those devices, maybe not into the retina implants and the suggestible cameras, but think about your customers, think about the zones and the devices and problems that they're trying to solve. Give them an amazing experience that's continuous across those devices. 
get your delivery model right, understand what your capability is, whether you need to offshore, onshore, how you're gonna differentiate. Use the agile and, and, and lean principles to deliver against that and, and explore and, and capture data and learn all the way through that. And finally, make sure you do something different, right? Understand the competition, understand what your USP is and amplify that as much as possible. In my view, if you get one of these pillars wrong, you're going to really struggle. If you get them all right, you stand a really good chance to succeed. And I just want to close off with one slide, which kind of frightened me. You know, there's nobody in here that's under 20, which means you probably don't get this. This is Facebook, an infographic that came out last week. It's Facebook and its features and all of the other apps around the outside, so these apps here. These are what the kids are using now instead of Facebook. So what does that mean for us in five to 10 years time? Because the kids don't use the internet like we do. Cool, that's it for me. Questions? Sure, yeah. I think we've got time for some uh, questions for those that want to know more about any of the content. There's one over here, Mark. Please just remind your name and organization. Dan from Telstra, don't hold that against me. Um, I'm interested in your CMS strategy aligned to what you were doing. How, did you have something existing that you had to adapt or and it, for, for something as content rich as what you're doing, I imagine it would be integral. So I'm just interested in that. Yep, we, we're on a journey with that one, as I think most people are. We started with a, a, a 10 year old internally developed CMS system that we called Stargate. One of the things that we did as we moved to the cloud in that story there was move to a new platform called Sitecore. Um, that's gone reasonably well. It's given us some options. What we're looking at now is how do we actually open up the platform above and beyond that so that we can share some of the data that we've got and share, because we, it's constraining us to some things like Microsoft technologies. So when we think about some of rap rapid prototyping, how do we get some of the smarter startups out there using Ruby on Rails to build things for us faster. So we're looking at architecture and REST APIs and, and creating more of a platform around our CMS to actually allow other people to access the data. 